thank you very much. And in, in a slight deviation from this announcement and also what is written in the program, I, I, I will speak in English because when asked to pay a price for, for speaking in German by writing two-page abstract, I thought it might be better to write the whole paper already in, in English. So I hope this does not create any, any problem. Um, ex except of a few cases, there are in Germany no larger collections of oriental manuscripts which go back in their creation to church initiatives. One of the few is the Andex collection, to my knowledge, the only one from the, from the Catholic sphere, um, the Andex collection I'm going to speak about in the next um, about 20 minutes. It goes back to a Franciscan monk of German origin who spent in the seventh decade of the 18th century a couple of years in Egypt and acquired there more than 100 Oriental manuscripts, which form the core of the present Andex collection. Who was this man? I believe this to be an image of him. We don't know it 100%, but there is a great likelihood that this shows a man by the name of Arsenius Rehm. He was born in, 1780, in 1738 in Lower Franconia and joined in the late 1750s the Franciscan order. 1768, he requested the permission to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, which he was granted. In mid-1769, he arrived in Alexandria, from where he proceeded, obviously, to Palestine. On his way back from there, he became chaplain of the French consulate in Cairo, in the service of which he remained until 1776, when he returned to Germany. Upon his return, he was as assistant of the lecturer for the Holy Scriptures, appointed lecturer of Arabic in the internal study program, the so-called Hausstudium, um, of his community, um, especially maintained for the training of priests. From 1780 until 1784 or 1785, he held furthermore the position of a professor of Arabic and later also Hebrew at the public university in Fulda, here we have this degree of, of nomination, which made him a, a professor at the Adolfiana. Um, from 1786 until his death in 1808, he was assigned to various duties within his order's province, none of them related to Oriental languages or affairs. And what has to be said about the collection, which is called after him also partly the Rehm Collection. While in Egypt, Rehm developed obviously an interest in learning Arabic. In 1771, he purchased an Italian Arabic conversation guide, which he then translated into German. Um, this, the Italian Vorlage is the oldest dated acquisition of what should become a collection of more than 100 manuscripts. And here you have both the title pages of the Italian book and also then of his German translation. In the following, Rehm acquired mainly manuscripts which one would expect um, to be of interest for a European cleric in the Middle East. Until 1775, so one year before his return, he collected a couple of works on linguistics, Christian religion, the Holy Scriptures, liturgical works, including missionary literature, catechisms, confession guides, etc. This obvious interest in missionary activities is also reflected in a work he composed in 1775 in Cairo, a German Arabic manual for hearing the confession. You see the title page on, on the left side. And then at the end of his stay, um, something remarkable happened. As can be seen from this table on the right, Rehm bought in 1776 a huge collection of manuscripts. And this is the most remarkably observation, all of them of Muslim provenience. And those of you who recognize that I said the whole collection would comprise more than 100 uh, manuscripts, actually 108. You will see this doesn't sum up to 108 because not all of these manuscripts contain an information on when Rehm um, purchased them. But it's obvious that the biggest number of manuscripts was bought in the last year when he stayed um, in Cairo. The purpose of this acquisitions is clearly mentioned in the owner's statements Rehm wrote in part of the manuscripts. I have here two 
Um, the one on the left side, it's then in Latin where he says that it is for the use of, of the members of his congregation. And the same is uh, re repeated here in French where it even specifies that it is for learning the Arabic language. So it was obviously decided at the latest in 1772 that Rehm should teach Arabic to his confrators um, as part of the Bible sciences, of course. And, it's not, and it is not surprising that Rehm equipped himself in preparation of this task with a set of Arabic books. But the composition of the collection with, with, with its heavy dominance of Islamic work, and most of them are really of religious character, comes as a surprise. It seems that Rehm really developed keen interest and great respect of Islam. This might be proven by the following examples. Um, first of all, the already mentioned sheer number. So this very heavy dominance of, if I may call them so, Islamic works. Second, he made then a list where he put all his manuscripts in an order and he put, what did he put on numbers one and two, the Quran. So he starts with the Islamic manuscripts and at the end, the Christian manuscripts follow. Um, so these are, um, the, I think it's number one, the Quran manuscript, yes. Um, third, on this left side um, inscription, he says, don't touch it if not in a state of purity. And this is a clear reflection of the Muslim usage. So it normally doesn't refer to a, let's call, non-Muslim. But obviously he had that much respect on, on the, of this book that he repeated this even for the readers in Europe. And finally, um, Rehm rest, he himself completed an, an incomplete copy of the Quran. I mean, he was not a calligrapher, but I think he tried to do it as nice as he could. And in the end, he repeats, or he says, Sadaqa Allahu al um Allah the Almighty has spoken the truth, which is also something which is not canonical to be in all um, Qurans to be found. There are even Muslim scholars who, who, who doubt that this should be written. But he obviously, from this local usage in Egypt, he repeated it. This all shows, in my understanding, a great respect. Um, and... and this is, comes a bit as a difference to at least attitudes which were, let's say, still common during Rehm's, Rehm's days. Um, we do not know, know which use Rehm really made of these manuscripts. One third contain very brief remarks regarding the content, often only a shortened rendering of the title. I, I will come back to that in a, in a short while. The works were kept at the Franciscan convent in Fulda, where Rehm lived in until 1791, before he was sent to other places of his order. Two works found through unknown channels their way into the library of, of Jan Peter van Suchtelen, a Dutch-Russian bibliophile. They are nowadays um, um, kept in St. Petersburg, and Rehm transferred a few manuscripts to the newly established public library in Fulda. The remainder of the collection was in 1851 purchased from the monastery in Fulda by Bonifaz Haneberg, a Benedictine theologian and Orientalist. Um, the collection was transferred to the newly established Benedictine Abbey St. Bonifaz in Munich, to which Haneberg belonged. The acquisition had been made possible by means provided by the Bavarian king. In 1854, Haneberg became abbot of St. Boniface, a position he held until 1872 when he was elected Bishop of Speyer. During his time in Munich, Haneberg traveled twice to the Orient, 1861 to Algiers and Tunis, and 1864 to Istanbul, Palestine, and Egypt. During both sojourns in the East, he acquired books and manuscripts which partly entered the collection at St. Boniface, which grew, partly also enlarged by manuscripts acquired in Germany and Italy, to 133 shelf numbers. Here we have two of the acquisitions he brought from Tunis, a manuscript and a lithography. With four other manuscripts recently discovered in the Abbey's library, the overall number of the Andex collection reached 137 volumes. Why it is called Andex Collection in 1942, part of the holdings of St. Boniface, including the Oriental manuscripts, were transferred to the monastery of Andex, southwest of Munich, known as the Holy Mountain, 
um, thus escaping destruction by the Allied bombardments of Munich, which also affected the Abbey's library um, heavily. The collection is still kept at Andex, and I think Andex is a well-known place even, even in Berlin, at least for its excellent beer. Um, a few remarks on the study and description of these manuscripts. The first to work with these manuscripts was Rehm himself. He numbered the manuscripts and added to approximately one-third um, short remarks on their content in Latin, often not more than an abridged rendering of the title. In two cases, reference to Cholius is made, meaning to the Lexicon Arabico Latinum by Jacob Cholius, published in 1640. 1654, which was regarded until the early 19th century as the best Arabic dictionary of European provenience. In one of the cases, there is an indication of an edition of the work in question. Um, we have here. Um, it is not clear whether the catalog of the Frauenberg. Fulda Library, established in 1780, contains information on the Oriental manuscripts, that there existed a very simple and barely useful hand list comprising 99 manuscripts becomes clear from a remark by the Orientalist Johann Gildemeister, who established in October 1847, within one week, a catalog of 107 manuscripts he was able to inspect during a stay in Fulda. The results are amazing, having to rely mainly on his memory, so he was in Fulda in the monastery, not at his, at his let's say, um, office, so to say. Gildemeister was able to identify most of the works and refer to many peculiarities he found in them. He furthermore made ample excerpts for further research. The quality of the collection surprised Gildemeister as he confessed in a letter, this is a title page and, and one example from the from the catalogue, it's a handwritten one, and this is the quotation, this is his uh, um, opinion on the collection. I find the collection of which I had to think that it would have been designed according to the taste of a monk far beyond my expectations. There are more than 100 manuscripts, among them 10 of first-rate quality, furthermore 10 to 20 relatively good and useful ones and the rest of medium quality, which would not be highly appreciated in the great libraries of Paris, London, and Leiden, but which are still useful for us, and there are very few very, there are few very bad and unimportant ones. Thanks to Frau Hoffmann-Ruf, who um, published um, these letters of the very interesting ones of, of Gildemeister. Haneberg, the purchaser from Munich, who informed the scholarly community with a short note on his acquisition of the Rehm collection, which was published in the ZDMG, shared Gildemeister's assessment of the collection's quality by saying, it offers something which is worth to be worked on. Great rarities are not to be found, but the whole collection together forms a quite complete um, apparatus for the knowledge of Islam, especially the subject of Sufism is well presented. Unfortunately, Ibn Nefarid is missing. And indeed, Haneberg devoted some scholarly attention to the manuscripts of the Rehm collection. He added information mainly of bibliographical nature to Gildemeister's catalogue and added very brief entries on the manuscripts which were acquired by him. Um, he furthermore wrote four scientific articles um, published in very serious publication organs, uh, which, were, um, um, which appeared between 1853 and 1869. Haneberg was, by the way, not the first to use the manuscripts from the Rehm collection for scholarly purposes. The Orientalists Arnoldi and Lorsbach, sometimes also called as the Orientalist of Goethe, had in the early 19th century worked with a couple of the manuscripts and Losbach published in 1804 even a brief study which was based on a medical manuscript which had originally belonged to the Rehm collection. After Haneberg, um, the interest in the manuscripts kept at St. Bonifaz um, weakened. It was not totally forgotten, but it was only in the 1930s um, that a manuscript of the collection was used for a scientific enterprise again. Wilhelm Heffening of Bonn University 
borrowed a manuscript for his research of Ibn Sina, and this was then later part of an posthumously published article in a German um, encyclopedia. You see here the Leishein, so the, the um, request to get these manuscripts um, from, uh, from Munich, this time still um, to, to Bonn. After World War II, Georg Graf, the Nestor of Christian Arabic studies in Europe, undertook some efforts to get the collection catalogued, but to no avail. At the latest, with his death in 1955, the collection disappeared from public or scholarly cognition. Information on it became dubious and misleading, partly pretending that the collection would have been destroyed during World War II. And then, all of a sudden, in 19. 83, a description of two Ethiopian manuscripts of the Rehm collection appeared in Oriens Christianus, the leading German periodical on the Christian East. The author Manfred Kropp, by that time a member of Heidelberg University, had learned from a bibliography of Ethiopian studies and sources published by a French Orientalist in 1952 based on Graf's information in his history of Christian Arabic literature about the existence of Ethiopic manuscripts in Andex. So Manfred Kropp visited the monastery, monastery in summer of 1983, had a glimpse on the collection and was allowed to lend the two manuscripts he was interested in. The real rediscovery and awakening of the collection uh, to scientific life happened then in 2010. Having come across its mentioning in Graf's history, I asked Professor Kaufold of Munich, the editor general of Orients Christianus, about his opinion, especially as the last scientific reference to the collection was made in an article published in Orients Christianus. Except of this, Professor Kaufold had never heard about uh, this collection, but being based in Munich, so he went to Andex. Um, together with the archivist, they searched but couldn't find anything and being very disappointed, he was nearly uh, at leaving the monastery when the archivist said, we still have a, a, a cupboard, a metal cupboard, I never looked into it, maybe there is something and they opened it and they found the whole collection, um, excellently preserved and this was then the starting point for some scientific activities by the um, Forschungsstelle Christlicher Orient, the Research Center for Oriental Christianity at Eichstätt University, to which I also um, belong. Um, we made an agreement with the owner, so St. Bonifaz Andex, and, and we were allowed to work on the manuscripts. I took over the responsibility for the cataloging, while my colleague um, Joachim Braun, um, he uh, made the digitization. So the, the Christian Arabic manuscripts we are working on. We are not making a full catalog, but we are only working with one third of the collection, are fully um, digitized. And when I asked Joachim, I said, send me a photograph showing you digitizing the manuscripts. He said, you know, I did it alone. How can I have a photograph showing me digitizing the manuscripts? And then I thought, oh, there's also no picture showing me cataloging them because this kind of selfies at work, it's something rather unusual. So I, I can show him um, only on that picture, but referring to a very important issue, the online campus um, Christian, Christian Oriental Studies. You should look this up. There are some really new developments um, supported by the Volkswagen Foundation. So we are still, I'm a leisure time scholar, so it all takes its time. Um, we are nearly done with the, with the catalog of, of these about 80, uh, 38 manuscripts approximately which will have, a, let's say, 400 pages approximately. So we're doing it in a very, very detailed way. But we still have the, the um, Islamic manuscripts, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful to the Staatsbibliothek that we, that we could integrate the meta um, um, data into Kalamos. So it's done, um, especially thanks to, 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 uh, to Torsten and all the rest of the team for having done this job. And, and so there is an access um, to the manuscripts, um, but um, let, me, let me conclude also by saying a few words on that. So what can be said as a kind of, of conclusion? It seems that still whole catalog, uh, uh, whole collections can be um, discovered, so this is very encouraging. 
We, only, we do not have only to deal with fragments kept here and there. There are still, and I, I think there are still more even. Um, second, I think that St. Bonifat um, deserves real great thanks for the good preservation of the manuscripts and it's, it's really dedicated cooperation with, with the Forschungsstelle but also with, with uh, Orient Digital slash uh, Kalamos. But, and this is number three, not being specialized in holding manuscripts, let alone such of oriental provenience, institutions like St. Bonifat need support in preserving this heritage and, and making it available for research. And this includes digitization. So this is also my request to the institutions specialized in that field. Please um, um, give a, a helping hand to institutions like, like the Abbey in, in, in making this heritage, this important heritage um, available. And finally, and this might close then the circle, um, the initial creator of this collection, um, Father Arsenius Rehm, deserves to be recognized as an early pioneer of a respectful recognition of Islam as a religion and its written tradition in, in Europe. So also this man deserves to be better known also, he was not, let's say, a, 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 an oriental scholar of, of great standing, but he was obviously someone with great interests and, and a very, very a positive attitude to, to the subject of his interests. And yeah, I think that's it.